We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Our next speaker, of course, is uh, our co-chair, um, Dr. Uh, Polly Wiesner, professor of anthropology at Arizona State University and at the University of Utah. And she's made so many contributions to the field of social and cultural anthropology that I wouldn't know even where to begin. Um, but much of her work is focused on gather hunter populations undergoing rapid transitions in, in different places around the world. Uh, but one thread in her research that, uh, that drew uh, her to us and us to her for, and as we co-organized this symposium was uh, the profound impact that she's st uh, had in studying the stories uh, that, and that storytelling plays in building communities uh, in gatherer hunter societies as well as including imaginary communities. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So during my first year with the Jeune Classe Bushman of the Kalahari, I was exhausted by the end of the day, by the endless constant requests for everything from tea to sugar to shoes. And the, the only condition, um, the only consolation was that I was not the only one who experienced this. The Jeune Classe did this to each other because basically in that society, the terms of relationships are the one who has gives to the one who's in need, provided that the need is real. And both fortunately for me and unfortunately, I was always the have and the need was always real. However, it did not take long for me to see, to feel that great relief that came at nightfall when requests, complaints, criticisms, ceased as people mellowed out and um, broke into song, dance, and stories, enveloped by the night and mesmerized by the fire. Storytelling often continued late into the night. At first, I didn't know what was going on. But later, as I learned more and more of the language, I realized that I was not in a small, isolated Bushman camp, but in a much larger, imaginary community held together by stories binding people up to 200 kilometers away, and that this imaginary community was absolutely essential for survival. So now, okay, so from, from the day to night, the great change. So first of all, we have to take a look at the lighting of the night. When did this begin in our evolution? Evidences from the traces of fire in archeological sites come from maybe over a million years, as Michael Chazan will discuss in this symposium. But it looks like the domestication of fire in hearths came sometime between um, 300 and 400 before the present. And below is a picture of Quesim Cave in Israel that has one of the first hearth that indicates continuous occupation and use of fire. Um, and so with the domestication of fire, whenever it was, the day was extended for hours into the night. Humans became the shortest sleepers of all primates by far. 
significant changes in circadian rhythm, which were rather expensive, and sleep intensity took place. Time was one, the time that was one was not economically productive time, but socially productive time because there isn't much one can do in the darkness. A space for myth, for myth and stories was gradually born, I think hand in hand with the development of language. So um, myths regarding the impact of fire are many. Um, you can't project it, the present into the past, but from studies of modern hunter-gatherers, it's possible to get some idea of the many roles of myths and stories in context without additional artificial lighting. Um, and most ethnographic studies have been centered on the day. The anthropologist goes back, has a good dinner, goes into the tent. But it is really time for much more research into the anthropology of the night. So I'm going to talk about a case study with the Junquasi foragers of the Northwest Kal Kalahari Desert in Southern Africa. Um, this society, people hunt and gather for making a living over 100 species of plants and 40 species of animals. Um, there are many scientific myths about the Junquasi. For instance, that great nutrition is possible from a 20-hour work week, which is not at all true. Life is hard. Um, that they are the original affluent society, um, a, a hypothesis put forward by Marshall Solins, arguing that wants and needs are either satisfied by desiring little or producing more. They argue that the Junhuasi have limited wants and needs. But every night or every day when you live in a camp, you know that's not true. So the myths exist. Um, so the subsistence technology among the Junghuasi is pretty basic. Camps are small with 15 to 40 inhabitants. However, the informal social institutions linking people are complex. So for one, there's marriage, arranged marriage with elaborate procedures at a young age. It form the crucial ties between groups. The distance between marriage partners are long. Only 20% are under 30 kilometers. Some are up to 200 kilometers away. Kinship is extremely important system um, composed of biological relatedness and name relationships. It's not hard to learn your immediate kin. But when you begin to know about your kin and how they're linked to the kin of others and other people's kin and how they're related, it is a lifetime job. Then you have widespread food sharing to reduce the risks of hunger, amongst other things. Vegetable foods are shared within the family. Um, obligations for meat sharing are very complex as they draw in people from other camps, often conflict-ridden. Their land tenure, people live in well-defined territories that are inherited bilaterally. Tenure is secured by assembling people together, attracting your relatives who all have rights, and occupying the land. And defense of land occurs if people try to infringe without permission. Then you have Harrow Exchange, which has been the subject of um, much of my research which is the exchange of gifts underlying mutual partnerships of support and which give access to alternate residences. And this old woman here is every piece of beadwork she's wearing comes from a different person on her network and she's trying to marry off her nephew by showing how well the family is connected and so she has bedecked herself in this search for a mate. So the average person has about 15 to 16 partners who reside within a radius of 200 kilometers. Um, they spend 3.3 months a year residing with partners. And this is a picture below of some of the gifts that are exchanged. And the map on the right are the um, exchanged partnerships of 
um, Shukong, uh, this old lady on top. So you can see how widely they secure themselves. But the question arises is, these are all very complex social institutions. How, uh, how are these transmitted? How do people come to understand them? Well, in looking at people's movement over time, I figured that the average Junghuasi in the sample had camped with and cooperated with 180 to 500 other adults over a lifetime. When you think of that in comparison to our social contexts, you know, this is, this is not a limited social sphere. Um, so the questions that I was asking was, how do people grasp the larger picture of social institutions that bind imaginary communities of people who do not live contiguously in space? And what is achieved during the firelit hours that is not achieved during the day? So um, there are three kinds of Xinhua oral traditions. You have myth and oral traditions and they create shared understandings about the unknown origins, landscape features, ceremonies, and so on. You have folklore and trickster traditions, which Matthias Gunter will talk about, and that really explores what happens when you push the limits of social conventions. And then my focus was stories, stories about real people and real events. And um, the data I collected in 1974 was 122 day and night conversations and conversations with five or more adults longer than 15 to 20 minutes and noted topic, focus, people, setting, time of day, participants, subject, praise, criticism, and so on. And then the stories later in 2011 to 2018 collected those told at night, and they were transcribed and translated by a team of Junghuasi who are now trained by Megan Beasley to work on computers to, to do this. So um, Isaac Dinesen wrote, slowly the center of gravity of my being will shift over from the world of the day, from the domain of organizing and regulating universal powers into the world of the imagination, with the coming of dusk and the lighting of the first star and the first candle. And this is exactly what you feel in Junghuasi camps at night. So I compared the day and the night conversations. And as you can see um, in the pie chart on the left, on the top, in the day, a lot of complaints and criticism go on bitching about other people. Um, it involves gossip, jealousy, norm maintenance, but we always say, oh, well, gossip maintains the norms. But in fact, over 30% of these complaints and criticisms were totally unfounded. They were competitive. Um, so, so much for gossip. And then you see at night, it completely changes, and 81% of the topics of conversation were stories. So you could really see this. And so the day regulates the economic and the social and lets people voice their complaints while at night it goes on to stories. So the firelit gatherings, um, the darkness really envelops people in a familiar canvas with the Milky Way above, which is spectacular in the Kalahari and the files, fires below. Very important is it obscure facial expressions. So in daily interactions, you see people's reaction, but around the fire, everyone's just staring at the fire, so you don't feel this criticism and reaction. It relieves all the stimuli of the day, and that seems to just release the imagination. Um, the harsher day mood of the day mellows, Men, women, and children gather mesmerized around the fire. They talk and they story, as they say it. Stories are often told in rhythmic speech of own experience or exploits of people who are not present. The listeners sit there stunned with expense, rolling with laughter, or close to tears, and arrive on the same emotional wavelength. Slowly, at the end of the day, the day's often very tense. Um, tensions fade with the embers. 
Who are the storytellers? Men and women, often older. Um, stories very subtly spread names and reputations in an egalitarian society. Listeners benefit from knowledge gained. Empathy generated from the ex is generated from the experiences of others. These stories are packed with social information and information about personalities. They generate trust from the knowledge gained. Little environmental information and few moral messages. Jun Glossy are egalitarian and they don't want someone to do a job on them. Um, this picture here is blind Lao Nga, who I've known for 40 years, and he was one of the most popular men in the area simply because he was an incredible storyteller. Totally blind here, he was sitting here and telling stories of the seductive Bushman girls who are prostitutes in a town. Never seen any of it, had every detail right. <laughs> um, Stories in the, okay, so really stories give the big picture of how institutions work. And people who can process stories to, um, to imagine, get people to imagine the big picture, they become highly influential. So many people just see what tubers are in the ground or what animals are in the veld, but people who can really master stories give everybody a sense of the big picture, the social institutions. One of these is marriage. For instance, marriage, they are arranged at a very young age. You can see from the picture here. And this woman wrote, as told in her story, and these are very popular stories. Oh, how is it that I must marry when I'm still a child, she thought. They struggled with me, carried me piggyback, and put me down at the marriage hut. Then the people smeared us with elan fat and red earth. They put beets on me and bedecked me with yellow bark cord ornaments. When they left, I went home and asked my peers to take those things off of me. She threw them aside. They removed them and put them in a heap to the side because I rejected him. The mother took a little whip of this side, my mother, and came to me and hit me saying, Kulka, stop doing this. This is a man, a good hunter, who I gave to you. Your father gave to you, so you must marry him. So this transmits to the younger generations the real trials of arranged marriages, um, and they prepare the young people for that, but they also describe the, the ritual procedures, which are very complex. So an institution is passed on in camps where you might only see two or three marriages in your lifetime. Then networks of harrow exchange and kinship, um, people on far-flung networks are brought right to the hearth in these stories, just even if they're 200 kilometers away. And um, they also transmit the great details of kinship relations. So this was a, just an excerpt from a story of exchange. She took out another skin apron and gave it to her aunt, the Lisa Nga. And then she gave out more gifts. It was the beginning of gift giving. Kashe tried to put the beaded headband on his head and it didn't fit. He gave it to my granny and gave other things to her. In turn, my grandmother took out an ostrich egg shell necklace and gave them to her grandfather, the late Kashe Nga, who then passed it on to the younger relative. And in this way, the kinship connections are learned. And then, one more, you have gathering of people in imaginary communities. Um, these imaginary communities come together when the food um, is available. In this case, it was a bumper crop of very, very nutritious marama beans. And people came within 200 kilometer radius. And the story is very long. It goes on for half an hour. Different people were there. Some were from Longa, the Isop Valley. Some were narrow from the f further south. Some from Gongwani, where there is a forest with lots of Cabridum trees. And there then there were the ones who lived where there was only one Mangeti tree. That is Gukoma and the people who are my father's relatives. Some were from Ngao who lived on that side, as well as those they called Sin Karosi. We were from different places. For example, the northern people were there. Those they called Kwisi were also there. Subswana people came carrying Junhwasi and firewood in their donkey carts. And so these virtual communities, maybe once every few years, 
come together, but they are remembered through these networks, and these then networks are reproduced and remembered through stories. Um, and then we have many other stories of broader institutions, trans healers, stories, they go up in trance, they travel to the spirit world, and they come back, and they tell people what they see, connecting the spirit world with the world of the living, um, and yeah. Um, so firelit stories expand the imagination, myths and folklore create common understandings, stories about real people give the big picture of social institutions that cannot be obtained from myth, and they also cannot be obtained from the sum of the mundane daily interactions of hunting and gathering. They give pictures of exchange networks, kinship, marriage, visiting patterns. They build a sense of imaginary communities inhabited by people who do not live contiguously in space. They explore the exploits, successes, and failures of others fostering understanding, trust, empathy, that make cooperation in these imaginary communities possible. So the question which we're all wondering is, will we ever know when this began? Stories are ephemeral, like the tracks of the trans dancers left in the sand. I think that possibly we may be able to pick this up archeologically when you begin to see an increased flow of good over longer, goods over longer distances, indicating the long distance ties of larger settlements when people form larger communities, and things like regional styles in artifacts. So I have many, many thanks to so many Xinhuasi. There are so many of them, but a few particular ones, Sao Goma, Tsebikao, and Ngukakoma, who taught me how to ask questions and to understand the answers. Thank you. <laughs>